Madeline Astor was the widow of the wealthiest man on the Titanic who went down with the ship on her maiden voyage, John Jacob Astor. She was merely a teenager, 18, and just one year older than his son when she started dating the 40-something John Jacob, which caused his first wife of almost 20 years to divorce him. I covered that scandal in my previous video that I will link in the description box. Also in that video, I asked you all if you wanted me to tell you the story of Madeline's third marriage, which was a cause of great embarrassment to her. So many of you said, yes, Ty, I want to know what happened. I'm glad that you all wanted to know because I was going to tell you anyway. The story is just that fascinating to me. Madeline ended her romance in first class with her first husband, millionaire John Jacob Astor, and she started her romance on another ocean liner, inviting a guy from second class to dine with her. He would become her third husband, Italian boxer Enzo Firmante. She was on the prowl for an Italian stallion, and he wanted some of that ass. Stir fortune. Was he her karma, plus some extra? Let's get into it. But first, if you like these videos about the most scandalous people from yesteryear who make Ty's Hot Miss History a time capsule for the culture, subscribe and hit the notification bell so that you can know every time that I upload one of these videos or every time that I live stream, and hit that like button to support this video. Thank you. Now, on to why you are here. When the Titanic hit the iceberg on April 14, 1912, at 11.40 p.m. ship's time, she sank less than three hours later, in the early morning hours of April 15th, and all of the ladies in first class, except for five, survived. Madeline Astor was one of those ladies who survived, thanks in part to her husband, who saw to it that she got into a lifeboat. John Jacob Astor took care of Madeline in the physical sense on his last day on Earth, and he had taken care of her and their unborn child in the financial sense, months before they ever left the country for their extended vacation. For his unborn son, he had left a $3 million trust. For his wife, Madeline, he left an outright sum of $100,000, which, adjusted for inflation, is worth a little more than $3 million today in 2023. Now, that $100,000 she got no matter what, but John threw in a couple of extras for her on the condition that she never remarried. The use of his Fifth Avenue mansion and the income from a $5 million trust. Sounds like a nice deal. So, of course, she collected her inheritance and lived happily ever after, right? Of course not. If she had, I certainly wouldn't be telling that boring story here. We need the hot mess, and boy oh boy did she ever land in one. Madeline would marry two more times after the death of John Jacob Astor. The first time was to wealthy banker William Carl Dick. He had actually been a childhood friend to Madeline. He didn't have Astor money, but he was the vice president of a trust company and part owner of the Brooklyn Times newspaper. So. Losing her stipend from the Astor $5 million trust didn't exactly cause her any financial stress. They had two boys together and eventually divorced. The standard stuff of which divorces are made, no real hot mess there. But that second time that she married after John Jacob Astor died, wow. If anyone held a grudge against her and considered her to be a young little floozy of a gold-digging homewrecker for being Astor's mistress while he was married to his first wife, Ava, well, they probably got a little bit of joy from seeing how the tables turned on Madeline with this third husband. When John Jacob Astor met Madeline in 1909, he was deeply infatuated by a young girl who wanted to be with him. He had lust in his eyes and she likely had dollar signs in her eyes. Fast forward to 1932, aboard the Volcania ocean liner, and now Madeline, at the age of 39, and according to numerous sources, fading quickly in the looks department, sat across a dinner table from Enzo Fiermante, with lust in her eyes. He was only 24, he was Italian, and there had long been sexual stereotypes about Italian men that made them out to be good lovers. 
and he was a prize fighter, a boxer. So, because of his profession, he was known to have a great physique and thought to be well-conditioned. So you can imagine all of the thoughts that her dirty little mind was conjuring up. By the way, she was not quite divorced from William Carl Dick yet. Just like Astor wasn't divorced when he started fooling around with Madeline, so many parallels. As for Enzo Firmante, his intentions were not pure with her either. But while she wanted sex from him, he wanted money from her. Yes, he was a prize fighter, but he wasn't a very good one. And he wasn't very different from a lot of 24-year-old men at any point in history. He wanted expensive clothes and watches and fast cars and women. So they sat across from each other at the dinner table, staring at each other and fantasizing. Madeline staring at his handsome face and how well his frame filled out his suit and wondering what was going on underneath it. Enzo, staring at her diamond rings and pearl necklace, wondering how much a pawn shop would pay him for the jewelry. It was Madeline's doctor who, yes, traveled with her because after Titanic, traveling made her a ball of nerves, as you can imagine. Anyway, it was her doctor who thought that it would be a keen idea to invite Enzo from second class to join Madeline for dinner in first class, and it would be her doctor who convinced Enzo to see Madeline for the second time. See, after Enzo had dinner with her that first night, he vowed to himself to never see her again because he had a wife back home in Italy, a wife and a son, but that guilt didn't last long. Like literally the next day, Enzo went up to the first class deck to see Madeline again. Her doctor had convinced Enzo that some of Madeline's rich friends might be of benefit to him and his boxing career. And let's just say the doctor didn't have to tell Enzo twice. He spent the whole day with Madeline, playing deck tennis and backgammon and eating and drinking. They were on a date that lasted all day. It was as if Tosca and Gianni didn't exist. You don't know who they are? Yeah, neither did Enzo at the time. Tosca was his wife and Gianni was his baby boy. That vow that he had made to himself when he went to sleep that night after he met Madeline was broken as soon as he woke up the very next morning. And after spending that glorious day of fun with Madeline, he told her that she was beautiful. When she smiled. And he did make that distinction. He said that when she smiled, she looked pretty and young, but that normally she looked old and frumpy. He kept the old and frumpy part to himself that night. That would come out later when he started flapping his gums to the press. But that night, she was beautiful. She told him that she thought that he was trying to flatter her because she knew that she didn't look as attractive as she used to when she was younger. Well, he told her he meant it and he kissed her on their second night together. It was after dinner, and they were out on the deck, under the moonlight. Enzo said that they were in, quote, a misty romantic heaven, end quote. Then he left the fantasy world of first class with his rich girlfriend and her fancy wealthy friends and retired to his second class reality, and the guilt set in once again. He started thinking about his wife and son back home in Italy. Before the cruise was over, he confessed to Madeline that he had a wife and that he needed to stop seeing Madeline. Well, Madeline, still married herself, said, damn that, okay? She said that she was not giving up that heart penne. She was very persistent about continuing her relationship with Enzo. So much so, that when their ship docked in Naples, before he disembarked to go off to see his wife and kid, she told him to join her at the Lido in Venice. Well, from Naples, Enzo went home to reunite with his wife and son, where he did not tell his wife about his affair with the American woman on the Volcania cruise ship. He barely had enough time to unpack his luggage when he received a telegram from Madeline that read, quote, Darling, come and see me. If not, I am going to Rome." End quote. 
In response, Signore Firmante hopped his behind on a train to Venice and upon arriving there, booked a room at the Excelsior on the Lido. And shortly thereafter, his American woman met him there and they got down to business. And I don't mean the kind of business that requires spreadsheets, but spread lengths instead. You know what I mean? Now, I won't go into great detail about that night that they shared in Venice because I need to keep my YouTube channel, but Enzo went into great detail about it, sharing with one publication how great it was, but still harping on her age. Clearly, the age difference was a big deal for him, and I get it. He was only 24 and she was 39. But here's what he said, in part, quote, She was different. Everything about her was subtly changed from the woman I had met on the ship. It was as if the years had slipped away from her. I saw her as a young and beautiful girl. End quote. Sheesh. He saw her as young, but he definitely knew that she wasn't. That would be a recurring theme in their relationship. Well, long story short, Madeline and Enzo abandoned their respective spouses and married each other on November 27, 1933. And just like her first marriage, this third one was also a scandal in high society and talked about in the newspapers. For her first marriage, her husband, J.J. Astor, was painted as the old creep who wanted a young plaything. For her third marriage, she was now in the role of the creep and her husband, Enzo, was the young plaything. Here's what was written in a 1933 Christmas Day edition of the Garrett Clipper. Ladies and Fighters Society lifts an eyebrow as Mrs. Madeline Force Dick is married to Enzo Firmante, an Italian prize fighter. Mrs. Dick happens to be the widow of Jacob Astor, who stepped aside as the Lusitania was sinking to permit his then youthful bride to take her place with the other women and children in a lifeboat. Okay, so let me stop there. Force was her maiden name and Dick was her second husband's name. And we all know that J.J. Astor died in the sinking of the Titanic, not the Lusitania. That is a crazy mistake for a newspaper to print because of the impact that Titanic had on the world at that time. The Lusitania was another grand, luxurious ocean liner that was owned by a different company from the owners of the Titanic. The Titanic was owned by the White Star Line, and the Lusitania was owned by Cunard. Cunard also owned the Carpathia, the ship that came to rescue Titanic's passengers. These companies were in constant competition to create the best vessels to transport the wealthy back and forth from Europe to the United States. The Lusitania, which was erroneously placed in this article, sank on May 7, 1915, three years after Titanic, after being torpedoed by German submarine U-20. Ironically, the Lusitania has a loose tie to the 1997 James Cameron Titanic movie. At the beginning of the film, when Rose sees the Titanic, she tells her fiancé that it doesn't look much more impressive than the Mauritania. The Mauritania was a sister ship to the Lusitania, and when she launched in 1906, she was the biggest ship on the sea, stretching out at 790 feet, which was beat out by Titanic's 883 feet. So it would have made perfect sense for people in those times to make those comparisons. see what all the fuss is about. It doesn't look any bigger than the Mauritania. You could be blasé about some things, Rose, but not about Titanic. It's over 100 feet longer than Mauritania, and far more luxurious. But back to the article. We also get a little more shade thrown at Madeline's age. Astor's then youthful bride. Okay, we get it. She's not young. It goes on to read. Discussion of the marriage makes much of the tragic background of Fiermante's bride. To think, say the dowagers, that Madeline would do such a thing as marry a prize fighter after Astor's noble act in permitting her to be saved, while he himself went to certain death. But then, 
Mrs. Madeline Astor Dick is a woman, after all. Enzo Fiermonte, even though he be a prize fighter, is a man. It is the inalienable privilege of any woman to marry any man, society's eyebrow to the contrary notwithstanding. So, this newspaper was definitely firing some shots at Enzo's low social standing, and also basically saying that Madeline wasn't worth saving from the Titanic, or Lusitania, now that her life had come to this. Oh well, she was all smiles at the beginning. But by the time that this was over, this marriage, Enzo made Madeline wish that she had kept her home-wrecking ways back in 1909, for she would leave this relationship abused, bruised, and confused. And just like Enzo left Madeline wanting more after those few glorious days on the Volcania cruise liner, I'm now going to leave you wanting more. But don't be like Madeline. Don't bother sending me a telegram. I promise that I'll wrap up this story in a part two. I'll also list my sources in part two. Until then, there was another woman who would have been seen as a contemporary of Madeline Astor and she knew how to find and marry rich men too. Some say that the term gold digger was coined to describe her. Peggy Hopkins Joyce. I published a video about her that you can see here. I will also leave a link to it in the description box. This video has been brought to you by me. Well, my Patreon is a sponsor for this video. If you like these dirty scandals on my channel, then you'll love my Patreon, Ty's Too Hot Hot Mess History. It has all of the stuff that I can't talk about or show here because it's just too hot, too violent, too sexual, too graphic, too much. Come and join us there for the Hot Hot Mess History. The link is in the description box.